introduce this program to uh, uh, write to something, and I'm going to interview the soon-to-be-famous author, uh, <laughs> Jeff Howard, <laughs> author of a book called Werewolf on the Range. First, Jeff, do you mind telling me, before we get into the interview, a little bit about your background? Oh, yeah, oh, sure. Um, I was a uh, policeman for about 14 years, and then I was in uh, the FBI for about 22 years, and I just retired recently, and now I have a new job uh, working at a university as an investigator. Not law enforcement, but an uh, investigator. Wow. that's uh, Now, what made you start, uh, what uh, first gave you the idea to write a werewolf novel? Because that's a departure from your normal career, right? Oh, yeah. You know, I knew I wanted to write way back in college. Um, but, you know, you got to have a real job while you're doing that to pay the bills. Yeah. And, you know, I thought, um, you know, the other thing I was interested in, obviously, is law enforcement. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of report writing in law enforcement, whether people are you know aware of that or not. And you have to be very uh, specific about what you're writing and how you're writing it, you know, to draw logical conclusions so someone can see how you arrived at this person may or may not have committed this particular offense. Right. Um, but I've always had, a, you know, an interest in horror and science fiction. Um, probably less so fantasy since I was a kid. Yes. Um, so I would always think about those stories and be drawn to those stories. Yes. And I remember, I remember very vividly the first time I read a Stephen King novel. My first thought is, I can't believe somebody's actually writing the type of book I've always wanted to read. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. It, that kind of. Do you remember uh, what book it was of Stephen King's? Yes, it was Firestarter. Oh, really? I enjoyed that book tremendously. Yeah, it was very early, you know, in, in his book writing. I think, I don't even know that that was his 10th book at that point, but uh, I actually got introduced because my brother uh, was reading Stephen King books and I had bought him, you know, the hardcover of Firestarter for, I think it was Christmas. And... I started reading it <laughs> and I ended up keeping it because I really, and I still have that particular book, uh, the first Stephen King book I ever read. So wow. that, that's kind of how that started. And then I thought, I think with most anybody that thinks about writing, um, you know, the things you're interested in or the things you would want to see, um, that's what you end up wanting to write about. So I've always been interested in those things. Now you asked specifically about how I ended up, uh, writing a, a werewolf book is, you know, I've always been interested in the werewolf story, but they've always been kind of the same. You know, yes. some poor slob is bitten by a mysterious animal uh, and then on the full moon turns into this monster uh, and he, he or she, usually it's a he, has no recollection of the horrible things that they're doing while they're the werewolf. Right. And, you know, probably the best, the best and most famous um, example is uh, Lon Chaney Jr.'s version of the werewolf, who's, you know, seriously concerned about the damage and the, the murder he is committing and just wants to be rid of the curse. Um, you know, uh, somebody comes along with silver bullets, uh, kills the werewolf, uh, end of movie, end of story. Now... Obviously, you know, everybody's familiar with Frankenstein and Dracula as being, you know, the first, quote unquote, man-made monster story in Frankenstein and the first vampire story with Dracula. Um, oh, yes. You know, famous versions. But if you ask somebody, hey, so what's the most famous werewolf book? There isn't one. There isn't one. That's true. There, I mean, there are. There's a book I read, um, you know, when I was kind of doing research for this thing um, a few years ago called A Werewolf in Paris, uh, which was written in the 20s and 30s that I found online and was recommended to me by someone at the Atlantic magazine when I, I wrote in and said, yeah, hey, don't laugh, but you are looking for uh, questions. Can you recommend any werewolf fiction for Halloween? Because they were... Yes. And that was on the list. And I read that book and it was very well written, but it was more of the lunatic werewolf, not the, you know, a human being that's, you know, cursed with um, 
maybe psychological problems, uh, but not the monster werewolf that I think most people think of. I'm not, th- I'm not talking about a wolf man, you yes. know, the Lon Chaney version. And I understand the limitations from, from the cinema at the time, but the, you know, up until probably around 1980s, remember the movie, the howling came out. Um, oh, yes, that was groundbreaking, but still. Yeah. But by today's standards, it's very cheesy and primitive. But <laughs> yes. they did things in that movie that you'd never seen before. Um, you know, that and American Werewolf in London came around about the same time. And it was the, yes. it was the transformation sequences that, uh, you know, really, you know, kind of caught my attention. That's what They're I think. Really of. fascinating. Um, and, you know, I like the howling werewolf better than the uh, American werewolf in London werewolf better. I like the howling werewolf better because it stood upright and right. the other one was on all fours. And that's, that's not what I think of when I think of a werewolf. So that, that's kind of where this came from, why I decided to write a werewolf book, but I kept having thoughts about, okay, what would be the original, so to speak, werewolf story? Um, and I thought, well, you know, when you think of timber wolves, you think of the West and, you know, um, the Old West in particular. And I thought, you know, right. I don't think I've ever seen a werewolf Western, which seems to me would be kind of a natural, you know. And that um, was set in North America, not in Europe. Right, right. So an American werewolf, I wasn't going to call it an American werewolf because that's <laughs> no. already been taken. But I knew I wanted the word werewolf in the title. So when somebody saw the book, they would know what it was about. Okay, this is about a werewolf. And then I thought on the range. And, you know, you think of that song, Home on the Range. And if you <laughs> you can sing it in a way where you can put werewolf on the range and kind of make it a, a scary song, not a happy song. Yes. So that's where that that's where my title came from. Um, but anyway, that's what I was trying to do. And I would get. Um, I know in talking to you in the past, we've we've discussed uh, that, you know, as a, you know, an aspiring author, you're really kind of a glorified daydreamer. And then you try to write down your daydreams in a format that's that's so true. Right. That's and so you get, true. You get you don't you don't get you know, you don't get the whole story all at once. You just get flashes of what you would like to see right. or, you know, it would be really scary if. If guys were sitting around a campfire and their horses started acting up and they knew something was out there, but they didn't know what it was. And, you know, when it when it either started growling or howling, especially, you know, back in the 1800s, I could see that could be a kind of a terrifying experience, you know. Yes. So that's that's they kind were of, interconnected by the Internet. Yes. So pre those days. Right. Yes, yes. Oh, this there was, was no connection. Uh, they would be totally alone. Right. In yeah, no. I mean, you're limited to newspapers and telegraph if it, if it was even available to you as far as communication. The weapons by today's standards are pretty limited and primitive. Um, so, you know, more of a equal footing, so to speak. Um, and this is something that is out to kill you. Um, and no help. Right. For example, nowadays we uh, think of ourselves setting in the cities. Yes. There's plenty of people around to help. Right. But in this, uh, in your version, they're on the prairie where there's yeah. no help, literally no help. Exactly. They are the help and they're right. helpless. Um, and I could go on about the story, but uh, I know you wanted to ask other questions. So. Oh, well. <laughs> Actually, did you experience any um, trepidation in writing it or, or nervousness or fears that you couldn't write when you first oh, started? Well, I think that goes, you know, with anybody that's writing something, you have this fear of, I don't know what to write today. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, and or I, I suspect that, you know, you and I are probably on the same page about a lot of things where you wake up in the morning and you're trying to go back to sleep. Because you know you you need to get up and write something, right? You don't know what it's going to be, and you know I think I think one of your questions is going to be you know what advice to aspiring aspiring authors is, um, right? Unquote. Um, and I and it sounds really trite because my my fiction writing 
a uh, professor back in college would say, well, if you want to be a writer, you just write. And you're like, you know what? That's, that's like, good advice, so, but it's really limited. <laughs> that, but I mean, really. it, it, it's true. So what, 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 I, what I do and what I think of is, you know, once you get over the hump where you say, okay, I'm going to write this thing, um, you kind of jump in and you write, you know, probably several pages all at once trying to get to the scene you had in your head that's either the opening scene or sets up the thing that you've thought, I really want this to happen in, in, my, in my story. And I mean, that kind of sets you on fire and you start dropping all these little hints. And, you know, when, when I sat down to write this, you know, like I alluded to previously, I had read several werewolf novels and I, I could probably give you a list if, if you wanted them. One of which was yours, the, yes. um, the Tainted Blood, which I really liked because Right. You know, it was it was an urban setting, uh, machine guns, mercenaries and a werewolf that knew what he was doing uh, and used his power uh, or his ability for his own ends, so to speak. Yes. OK, because yes. I would recommend your book as a good. Hey, this is really kind of cool. This is this is unusual. Um. And then there was another one written by, uh, unfortunately, a police officer that was killed in the line of duty. It was called The Wolf Man, oh. uh, Nicholas Pekarik or something. I know I'm butchering his last name, but but anyway, you know, he was killed uh, in the line of duty. Yeah, he was killed in the line of duty. He was a New York City police officer, oh, uh, uh, volunteer police, I think. He was trying to get on the force, and he was also a writer. Uh, and I'd heard about this book and I read it and it was, it was about, it's about 10 years old, 10 or 15 years old at this point. Right. Um, but you know, I'm also reading these other books and you know, like anybody that's ever read a book who thinks they want to write a book, uh, you say to yourself, I could do better than that. <laughs> I, I, I could have written that and yep. this got published, you know, you, you everybody said that at one time I could have written that. <laughs> um, and which, which sounds easy. And it's not, it but truly does. Um, once you sit down and start to write it, I mean, you really have to be committed. So, so my advice isn't just write. It's okay. Know where you want to go. Know what you want to do. Um, I know you're going to ask me if I use an outline or not. I sort yes, of use an you, outline. Uh, plot your novel out completely before you sat down to write it, or I, make it up as you went along. Both. Uh, I would love to sit down and plot it out and know what's going to happen. But, um, you know, so you'll hear people say, you know, write for discovery. As you're writing, things occur to you. And, you know, you've heard the stories about authors that um, are writing a book and the, the characters kind of take over the story. Right. And it's really true. Because as you're as you're writing their backgrounds and as you're mentioning, you know, events that happen in their lives, other things occur to you that you're thinking that would actually work really good in my story. You know, if I put that in, if it was like a key plot point or this explains where this particular character is coming from and why they're here. And what? this will set up a really good conflict later. Um, so, you know, that. that you know, right is the advice, but um, I know a lot of people, you know, it, it takes a lot of discipline. Um, you know, when I wrote that book, I sat down and said, I am going to write every day until this thing is done. Okay? Really? And you think to yourself, yeah, I can do that <laughs> because <laughs> words are cheap, you know. Um, but, you know, after you've worked all day and you're tired, you yeah. know, you are my job. And already involved a lot of writing. So, I mean, it was a different kind of writing, but, you know, there comes a point when you're writing and you're just spent, you know? But That's I told a good myself. Way of putting it too, right? That's a really yes. good way of putting it. Because you get to the point where you're saying, you know, screw it, I'm done. I, I cannot write anymore. I'm just, I need yep. to watch TV. I need to watch TV and relax. Um, go mindless for a little while, right? You do. It's, it, it is. It's, you know, I mean, you can go and read something, but it's got to be not what you've been working on. It has to be something different. So right. I, I promised myself that I would write every single day. And I kept track of how much I wrote every single day. Um, and you said, do you plot it out? 
uh, the whole, whole thing. No, I kind of knew where I wanted to be or what I wanted to do. Um, but, you know, you're kind of hanging there. Hey, how am I going to end this thing? You know, <laughs> yeah, and, for your first uh, book particularly, it's yeah. very difficult to plot out everything in advance. Yes. Maybe your third book or fourth book, you can plot it out in advance. And the second, um, you hybrid it. Right. And, uh, but I think that first book is very difficult to plot out every detail in advance. Yeah. I've uh, talked to authors that uh, do, but there are very few and very few successful authors too. Right. Yeah. And you don't want it to read like a formula either, you know? Right. Right. That's a good point. It's like, Oh, okay. I checked that box off onto the next scene, you know? Um, so yeah, the first one was, uh, well, this one, this was actually not the first thing I ever wrote, but, it was, uh, you know, kind of see what happens. Um, I told myself, I think a normal novel is around 300 pages. Right. And, you know, in the beginning, you're scared because you're thinking, am I going to be able to write 300 pages? <laughs> yeah, and, I know the feeling. And then you're like, you get to a certain point, you're thinking, I don't think I'm going to be able to wrap this up in 300 pages. <laughs> yep. Okay. Which is kind of a good feeling, but you know, when you read the standards for the industry, um, it's it's like, well, you know, a horror novel should only be between uh, oh around eight eighty thousand words, and I'm like, oh man, I I totally blew over that, and I didn't <laughs> even write about all the things I was planning on writing about. So, yeah. yeah. So, but I, like, you could give us a synopsis of your uh, story, just without giving too much away. You can tell us a bit about it. I will. It's um, I, I worked a lot with Native Americans in my career uh, with the FBI um, out in the area, you know, around the Nebraska South Dakota border, which is where I set this novel. Um, the characters are um, uh, Civil War veterans. Um, pr primarily a white officer who oversees, uh, the Buffalo soldiers of the time, um, who are, you know, uh, you know, the Negro soldiers that were sent out, you know, as part of the cavalry, um, to basically round up the Indians. Right. Right. So, I mean, there's some overlap or some, you know, similarities to what, you know, people complained about during the Vietnam war about the white man is sending the black man to kill the yellow man. And, you yep. know, and, you know, if you look back, we kind of did that before the white man sent the black man out to kill the red man and, um, you know, kind of round them up and put them on reservations. Yes. Um, I mean, so those things really happen, but. It was a terrible time, right? It, oh, it was brutal. And, you know, the other thing I was going to say, because, you know, one of the other things I've done, you know, I, I draw on a lot of life experience. One of the things that um, I did in my life was if you've never been to a Civil War reenactment, you should really go. I mean, you've seen movies about the Civil War. Yes. Um, you've seen, you know, TV shows and stuff. But to be there in person when literally thousands of people dressed up in either Union or uh, Rebel attire are firing, you know, fake cannons and fake guns at each other, um, you know, they're like, there's these guys over here on this hill, and there's these guys over here on this hill. They start shooting at each other, and then they start running at each other. And you don't really experience the brutality of the war until you're, you know, like right there watching it. Wow. Um, I used to live in Virginia uh, near the Spotsylvania battlefield, and I saw a reenactment of one of the battles. And it was, it was really, really brutal, you know, to it's see. It's very lifelike, I take it. Oh, yeah. It's like, well, you know what it's like to go to a play versus a movie. It's more intimate. Right. You can see the expressions of the people that are, you know, on stage. But we're talking thousands of men, you know, out there firing muskets, firing cannons on horses with swords. I mean, they're not really killing each other, but they're laying down like they died. Right. You know? And um, I mean, it's like inspiring. It's hand, it's hand to hand combat, and, that, and you know, and plus, you know, during that time period, um, <laughs> hospitals and medical services were not nothing to write home about. If you got <laughs> shot, yep, and you were unlucky enough to get a surgeon that really didn't, they just lopped off that part of your your leg oh, or your arm, God. 
Yes. And off you went, you know. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's set during that time period. And you have uh, Civil War veterans and um, you have, um, you know, ex-slaves from the South who are among these Buffalo soldiers. So um, and they're out on the prairie. Um, the Buffalo soldiers were called such by the Indians because of, you know, their appearance um, and similarity to the to the Buffalo. Yep. Um, I mean, and that's where they came from. These people really existed. And I thought, OK, what if what if this group of Buffalo soldiers is attacking the Indians? I read a book. Another book I read is kind of preparation, but I also was interested in it's called Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. Oh, yes. OK, so you're familiar with the book. So anybody that reads that book, you're reading it. And, you know, again, you 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 don't really understand the you know, I mean, you know, the story about, you know, westward expansion and. Um, you know, how the West was won, so to speak. Right. Uh, and it, it involved, uh, you know, basically the genocide of the Indians. Well, this book does a very good yeah. job of step-by-step step describing. It's remarkable how much of that of our consciousness we have forgotten. Yes, yes. And it's, you're reading this book and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe they did that. Yep. And they just kept doing it and doing it. And you're like, oh my God, this is terrible. Yep. This is horrible. This is, I can't believe they did this to these people. And then by the time they get to Custer, you're, you're rooting for the Indians. You know, you're looking <laughs> at the, you're looking at the chapters and it says, where's Custer? Because they need to get some payback. And I thought, you know, what if the Indians had a werewolf? And that's kind of how my, my. That's, that's the ticket. It's, it's, you know, and then you're like, okay, that kind of ties all my, my stuff together. You know, I threw all the full moon and the silver bullet stuff out the window. Yep. I was, okay, what if what if this was real? What if, you know, there was a freak monster animal out there? Um, I mean, and, you know, at that time period, that could have happened. I mean, not not for real. But you could see how the people at the time would, you know, they wouldn't react to they it. They would question it, but you'd be in a position of, you know, if I try to explain this to somebody else, they're not going to believe me. They're going to say, oh, you saw a bear. It was a bear, you know. Yep. So all that stuff is in there. You know, they basically they attack the Indians. They round them up. They kill about half of them. And then, you know, they're they're supposed to move them to, you know, the fort and then on to uh, the reservations, which was, you know, going on at that time. Um, well, while they're in tr in transit, while they stop for the night, they're attacked by a werewolf. Um, and it literally, you know, just rolls through them um, with impunity um, yep. and, and kills several of these soldiers and wounds uh, the, the main characters, you know, basically his right hand man. Um, now that's exciting stuff. Yeah. And and you could you could see you could see the violence involved. That's the other thing. My 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 take on some of the, the werewolf movies that I've seen is they're kind of tame. Yep. mine's pretty mine's pretty violent and it's intentional um and then i mean i can go more into the the details of of the plot if you want but i thought okay so i've got these i've got these buffalo soldiers that are like 90 percent of my cast in this thing i said you know i think i think i need some former confederates in there to kind of right. you know raise up the tension it's not just this werewolf but now you've got these mercenary former rebel soldiers that, you know, look down upon these Buffalo soldiers. They think um, they, these guys don't know what they're doing. It, it's a bear or something and they're just chicken shit. And that's I'm sorry. <laughs> yep. Uh, little did they know, right? Little did they know it's worse than they thought. Right. Right. And, you know, so there's the racial tension. And I thought, you know, that's kind of like what's going on these days. Right. Um, you know, if you just kind of look at, you know, the news headlines and, you know, my, my stories are, I, I like to think they're revenge oriented or I believe in, you know, comeuppance where the bad guys get what they deserve. Um, cause I don't, I mean, there are stories like that. Uh, right. I just don't think and they're very a, unique though. Yes. In they're the like, horror genre, they're very unique in the horror genre. 
Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, Tales from the Crypt. Yep. Um, I think there's a new show on uh, um, on Shutter. It's called Creep Show, but it's the same from those old comic books, the EC comics of the '50s, where right. you know somebody will do something to somebody else, and then that person dies violently. Basically, is what happened. Yep. You know, in, in a in a unique and you know twisted way, kind of. <laughs> now, what were your uh... Is there any part of the novel that w- was most difficult to write? Um, you know, like, uh, that uh, challenged you? Yes. Um, you know, like I said, I, I, I made myself write every day. And sometimes I would sit down and I would not know, you know, what I was going to write. And my advice to, you know, anybody that's writing is, well, I would always start, you know, at the beginning of the chapter I was writing or somewhere in the middle of the last big scene. And then it would, you know, like re-energize me or, you know, get me back in the direction I was headed. And then it would like, oh, yeah. And then I would think of something. That's the Hemingway formula for that, right? Is is that what you call it? Okay. Yes, the Hemingway formula. Because Hemingway always said he stopped in the middle of a scene. Yes. So he'd come to it fresh in the morning. Uh Uh-huh. I would always try to finish the scene. So I wouldn't forget how I wanted it to end. And then I would go yes. back. And I, I would think improve it the next day. Now, right. So that, that was my biggest challenge was making sure I a had a modified Hemingway to... approach, right? Yes. Yeah. The, the, the Howard approach, <laughs> which is a pretty good way to write. Right. Yeah. So that, 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 that's what I did. And that, that, that was a challenge. Now, um, you asked me if I did research, um, you know, I would have to check myself every once in a while. If I wanted something to happen, I had to check and see if that thing existed. You know, ah. you know, I had to say, okay, when, what, what kind of guns would they have been carrying? When was it invented? Uh, did the thing I'm writing about even exist? You know, right. I'd have to be really careful. I'm sure I missed something, but I would go back a couple of times and, you know, I'd have to fix something or I'd have to make sure, check myself. Uh, whether that thing or that event had actually occurred. I think in the main, your research really paid off, Jeff. It really did. Yeah, and I, I, I read, you know, there's a, uh, the main character. Uh, his name is Kincaid. Um, he's the, the, the major in charge of these Buffalo soldiers. Right. Uh, which is how that worked back then. It was a white officer, and then all the black um, soldiers were enlisted. The Buffalo soldiers were enlisted. There were no black officers. Wow. Um, he was he was a he was a prisoner of war at Andersonville, which is um, one of one of the most notorious and brutal uh, uh, Confederate prisons during the war. I mean, they were literally they literally at one time had 30,000 Union soldiers basically locked up in a stockade. Those were Andersonville. Right? It was called Andersonville. It yeah. was in Georgia. It was a horrible place and it was awful it was truly awful that's the other thing i would point out to people is as brutal and as um uh terrible and as the werewolf was right as as my book is the the right reality of what men did to other men is far worse right and you know i i didn't even begin to capture the terrible things that happened just at that one prison. It's terrible when you think that you can have a werewolf in a novel. Yes. The men are the real villains. Yes. Yes. And that, that's kind of what I was going for. My, my, my werewolf is kind of the hero. Yes. In a, in a twisted way. But if you look at it, you think, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's like a Godzilla movie. You know, the first Godzilla movie, Godzilla was the villain. Yes. Since then, he's he's kind he's of been a hero. Yeah, and <laughs> until he's a, not an odd phenomenon, really. <laughs> it, it, it is. Now, were there any characters that uh, gave you trouble framing them or understanding how to portray them, or the, any characters that stood out really? It, the hardest ones for me was getting in the heads of the Indians themselves. I mean, it's because Why that would be logical. Yeah, because they're kind of they're kind of the victims. They are the victims in you know the the ultimate victims in my in my story of you know circumstance. And still are really. And and they and they still are. They're in they're in rough shape. Um, but it was you know kind of portraying how their society was 
you know, before we came along and started destroying everything, you know, you know, from their point of view, right. I mean, if they'd had equal weapons, it would have been a fairer fight. Right. Um, but they didn't. And they were, you know, treated like garbage. And so that was the hardest. And, you know, even looking back, I think, man, I, I hope people don't look at, you know, my, my Native American characters as being, you know, too one dimensional. Um, one of them in particular is That's pretty- a curious thought, uh, you know, Jeff, honestly, that is very curious. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, obviously I'm familiar. I, I have a lot of familiarity with Civil War. Right. Uh, because that's what we learned in, in, in high school and in college. You right. know? And right. we learned about slavery, you know, in high school and college. But other than, you know, the Indians were here and then we took all their land away from them. They don't really go into a lot of depth about their society, you know. Right. And, and at one point in the book, I point out that. You know, at some point, you know, when the when the the pilgrims were coming to North America from from Europe, there there came a point, I'm sure, where, you know, the natives were like, yeah, these people keep coming and visiting. And now they they're no visiting, idea. And now they're multiplying. Right. Taking everything away from us. I mean, it's like. It, this unstoppable force. It's like, oh, okay, here comes Godzilla out of the it's ocean. It's like the floodgates had opened. Yes, yes. And it just got worse. You know, it wasn't, they weren't going away. Yeah, it's okay if you come and visit. But when they stopped going away, <laughs> I think there had to be some some realization that this is bad for us. So, Yeah, really, honestly, that had to sink into them at a certain point. Yeah. But... When you think of it, though, they started on the East Coast and they began expanding, expanding, expanding. So yeah. the West Coast, West Coast Indians didn't really have any experience with them. Right. Yeah. And yeah. they really found out the hard way. They did. I mean, you know, at one point, if you look at the history of it, you know, they said, OK, we're we're only going to take the land up to the Mississippi River and right. then you know, the rest will remain, you know, Indian land. You know, and treaty after treaty was broken. Treaty after treaty was, you know, rewritten. And, you know, here we are. Yeah, that was horrible, right? A horrible time. Now, uh, do you have a sequel in the making for your yeah, book? You know, like I like I told you earlier, you know, when I first thought, OK, this will be like 300 pages. And then I'm like, oh, I'm not going to be able to wrap this up in 300 pages. And I think the thing I sent to you ultimately was around 370 pages. And even though you said, well, you you just keep on writing. I was like, well, <laughs> I think I need to wrap this thing up and, you know, I'll save some for next time. Um, but, you know, like like I said, you know, you, things start occurring to you about the, the various characters and you're like, OK, I can right. pick this thread up here. And, you know, I kind of threw some things in there, you know, after we started talking uh, that, you know, OK, we've got we've got this situation here. Sequel, right. I'm sorry, what? That lead to the sequel? It would lead to a sequel or, you yes. know, it's a satisfying, you know, if this is the only book I ever wrote, it has an ending. You're yes. not like, okay, yep. so then what? But <laughs> as you're reading it, you could say, okay, well, I could see this coming into play now. I could see, you know, this character being explored more. And I could see, you know, if, if vengeance and comeuppance is your theme, there's a lot of points in history where somebody could go, you know, werewolf could appear and start, you know, you know, giving some back, so to speak. For example, during the time of the Nazis. Yes, uh, I could bring them through, um, uh, you know, both world wars. Right. I could uh, bring them just into Reconstruction after the Civil War. Oh, yes, that's true. That's true. South. I got to thinking, I got to thinking, what if. What if the werewolf was was uh, an African American and a former well, slave? Well, and that's a far, back, honestly. You no, know, and it's like because hey, I don't hey, think there's very much been done along those lines, right? No, no. I mean, I'm trying to actually think, nothing comes to mind. Have you ever seen a a a, a black man werewolf movie? And I can't no. think of one. I can't think of one either. And I'll I'll tell you one of the things. I got to share something with you real quick. One of the things that uh, occurred to me, I was reading a book. It was about Charles Manson. 
Really? And Charles Manson uh, had suggested to someone that they do a movie about, you know, the um, some people aren't going to like this, uh, you know, the return of um, the Messiah of Jesus as a black man in the deep South. Because that's not what people think of <laughs> when they think of the return of the Messiah. And it's, yes. it's deliberately controversial and um, confrontational. Yes. So that, that, that kind of came from that. I'd imagine so, right? But a werewolf, a black man, a werewolf? Yes. That's worth exploring, right? So, uh, the only thing I get worried about is, uh, well, you're not black. How do you know what it's like to be a black person? Um, you know, because, you know, recently, so, uh, I remember the one woman that wrote, uh, uh, what's the book about the, the uh, South Americans, the Mexicans? They're not really Mexicans. They're South Americans. They came from, um, like, Nicaragua or something, trying to escape the gangs down south. And the woman wasn't a Hispanic. And it was a really good book. Oh, American Dirt. Right. American dirt. That woman took a lot of a lot of heat because they're like, well, you're not even you're not even Hispanic and you're writing a Hispanic person's story. It just so happened, you know, years before that book came out, I had asked a friend of mine to recommend. Hey, do you know, a, do you know a good novel about right. a, a, about a Hispanic person or a South American person coming to America? He recommended that. I, well, I I wanted to know. I want, they were they were going to suggest a book for me, but I was thinking I kind of like to read that story from that point of view, you know, right. coming to America from South America or uh, Mexico or, you know, the South American countries. Um, and then, you know, when that book came out, I said, yeah, that's exactly the kind of book I was wanting to read. And then she started taking all this heat over it. So that that's my yeah. worry, you know. I think uh, James Patterson, though, has been a successful example as a white uh, man writing as a black, black man is Alex Cross, detective yes. series? Yes. He hasn't received any flashback for that. True, because, you know, Morgan Freeman's playing him in the movies, so that probably didn't hurt. <laughs> um, no, nope. that really but, didn't hurt him. Right. You're right. Uh, it, it, things like that. Things yeah. like that. All right, well, we better wrap this interview up. Okay. It's been a sure. pleasure interviewing you, Jeff. I really appreciate your time and everything, and... Uh, We'll get we'll do this again, right? Oh yeah, sure. Anytime you want. I, All right, I didn't good. mean to talk so much, but it's it's funny what oh, what that's... you know when you start <laughs> start explaining it. So. Yes, that's really funny. So all right, until next time. Okay. Bye. Thanks a lot, Rick. Have a good day. You too. Bye bye.